New Faith. Get your calendars ready because these are your weekly announcements. Brought to you by the ministries here at New Faith Church and Dr. Andre J. Lewis. Your announcement starts now. Unbroken, the Bible study series presented by Dr. Andre J. Lewis begins this Wednesday, November 11th at 12 noon and at 7.30 p.m. Join NFC virtually as Dr. Lewis covers 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 10, the resume of the week. Stream live via Facebook Live, YouTube, or at www.newfaithchurch.org. New Faith Church, in partnership with Martha Castix Tatum and Amera Group, will host a community flu shot drive through clinic at no cost and open to everyone in the community ages three or older. Thursday, November 12th, from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. at the Faith Connection, located at New Faith Church. You do not need to be an Amerigroup member to receive a no-cost free flu shot. This event is drive through only. If you have it, please bring your insurance card and photo ID. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. The New Faith Church will be launching a new homeless initiative to provide ongoing ministry to our brothers and sisters who are deprived of shelter. If you are interested in being a part of this ministry, please contact Reverend Joseph Johnson at 713-434-4021 or email jjohnson at newfaithchurch.org. New Faith, it's that time of year again. Let's give thanks by being a blessing to our community. We are asking members to pick up Thanksgiving bags with shopping lists to fill up your bags to be returned on November 14th between 9 a.m. and 12 noon. And on November 21st, beginning at 9 a.m., New Faith Church will host our annual Thanksgiving basket giveaway at the Faith Connection. Our goal is to provide 500 turkeys to those in need in our community. There will not be pre-registration. We will have a drive through giveaway. First come, first serve. The parking lot opens for the drive through at 7 a.m. If you would like to contribute or volunteer, please contact Rev. Joseph Johnson at 713-434-4021 or jjohnson at newfaithchurch.org. New Faith Church serves more than 4,200 families today. New ministry initiatives have been forged and continue to develop. The campus complex reflects our increase over the years and our call to Christian discipleship. As you look at our campus, I'm sure you can see the recent improvements and additions that have been made to provide a more comfortable worship experience for all of our church family. God wants us to do more, and he wants us to relieve our debt as well. We firmly believe the way to do this is through biblical tithing and our I Love My Church campaign. Take a look at the progress we have made to date. As of October 31st, we have received a total of $657,380.26 in cash contributions towards the I Love My Church campaign. The numbers presented have come from 765 congregants participating to date. Those that have made the commitment to participate in this effort, we say a huge thank you. Your faithfulness is definitely making a difference. Those who have not made the commitment, we invite you to pray about being a part of the I Love My Church campaign. God will honor your faithfulness as you help to fulfill the vision of conveying the light. You are blessed to be a blessing. Come on, new faith. Type in the comments, hashtag I love my church. And now let's give a special welcome to our new members. This concludes today's announcements. We'll see you next week. Good morning, New Faith family and friends. We welcome you in this morning. As you can see, we are representing our respective organizations. I'm Tracy Fletcher, and I'm representing Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and we have... I'm Vanessa Miller, and I'm representing the ladies of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And I'm Demetria Jones, representing Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. And I'm Shamika LaFleur, representing the ladies of Santa Carmeda Sorority Incorporated. And we just invite you to come on in with us, praise God with us. If you're in your living room, your kitchen, with your family, by yourself, come on in. Let's go to the sanctuary. Y'all ready? Let's yeah. go. Sure. Let's go.
Hallelujah. Come on, let's do it. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Come on, new faith. You ought to be clapping your hands. It's another Sunday morning that the Lord has graced us with. And we're going to give him praise. Come on and clap your hands. Come on.
really been good to you, you ought to be clapping your hands. You ought to be waving your hand and testifying. Say, I know God has been good to me, and I got to praise him.
We want to welcome you today to this wonderful day that the Lord has allowed us to worship him. We come to worship him in spirit and in truth. We want to just welcome you in to the new faith experience. We want to let you know that there are prayer partners available to you. Somebody is praying with you and will pray for you along with life's trepidations and anxiety that has presented itself, you'll find those numbers and the prayer numbers on the screen, and they will pray with you and ask God on behalf for you as they intercede for you. Let us pray. Our Father, our God, we thank you so much for just the opportunity to come before you we extol you, we recognize that you are God, we hallow your name, we say that you are wonderful, you're a wonderful savior, counselor, the mighty prince of peace. Thank you that you've allowed us to come. A wonderful God like you would allow a sinful man to bring his issues to you. Lord, we lay all of our cares at your feet on this day. They are many, oh God. Lord, the trepidations of our, our, our present society and this election and things that are causing anxiety within the home. We start by lifting the home right now. All of the family issues that are going on as we see in our households, God, we ask that you would give them your word as a means of conflict resolution, oh God. We thank you right now that you're still God. No matter what the climate is, you will always be God. And so we find our peace, our solace, in that you are still God. No matter what is going on, no matter what the election turns out, no matter who's in the White House, as long as you are on the throne, we find our peace in you. We find that you are able to do all things. And we rest in your word because your word says that we have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed beg bread. You have always taken care of your children. You've always provided for us. So God, we say continue to be God. And we rest in the immutability of you, God. You are just immutable, you don't change. So what you did yesterday, you will do on tomorrow. Oh God, and then if you don't do any more, you've already done enough from the completed work of Calvary. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for dying for us, that we might have a right to the tree of life. Oh God, we just thank you so much. We stand here, God, with so much thanksgiving in our heart 
Not that Thanksgiving is a day, but every day is a day of Thanksgiving. Thank you, God, for waking us this morning. Thank you, God, for giving us some small provisions. God, we got out of the bed and we had our health and our strength. We had our eyesight. We had a roof over our head. And now we pray for those who didn't have those provisions, God, but we know that you can provide them. Those who need jobs, God, we know that you can do it. We're just waiting on you to turn this thing around because we know that you can. You're the only one that can fix, fix us in this pandemic time. We love you, God. We bless you. We honor you. And we said thank you so much for the leadership. Thank you for this man of God that you put here. And God, you had already ordained him for this time. Even before he was in his mother's womb, you had already called him out for these times. Thank you for his leadership. Thank you for his faith. Thank you for him standing on your word Sunday in and Sunday out and every Wednesday night because, God, we need to hear from you. We don't need another poll. We don't need another result, but we just need you, God, to step into our situation. So now, God, we go to our seats with thanksgiving, loving you for who you are. We'll keep being your people if you continue to be our God, and we know you will, God. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you. It's in your precious name we do pray. Amen.
Amen. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made, and the Bible says that we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. And I am glad indeed that God loves us so much that he grants us another expression of his grace and his mercy. Amen and amen again. This is our HBC Sunday, our HBC Sunday as we celebrate the historical black colleges and universities all across our nation and all across our land. As we celebrate their presidency, we celebrate the support of their communities, and most of all, we celebrate the students that have gone on to do tremendous things in this country and even in this land. And so we salute you, we salute you, and we salute you. On this day, I want to take a detour from the benefits of Beatitudes to deal with this whole idea of our historical black colleges and universities. I want to speak to our young adults and our youth and those of our Christian family alike today. I want you to turn with me to Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16. I want to look at a familiar passage of scripture. Judges chapter 16 verse 23 to 31. On well, next week we'll begin again on the benefits of the Beatitudes, but this day I want to share with you this morning Judges 16 verse 23 to 31. Hear the words of our God. Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. For they said, Our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God hath delivered unto our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass, when their hearts were merry, that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport. And they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me, that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all of the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once. O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up of the one with his right hand, and of the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. I want to talk today from this thought, Breaking Bad, Choice and Consequence. Breaking Bad, Choice and Consequence. Walter White is a main character of an AMC series entitled Breaking Bad. He's a high school chemistry teacher turned drug kingpin of the entire New Mexico state. Five season series begins, we learn that Walter has cancer, he has no money, and he has not long to live, and his wife is pregnant. He has been dealt ultimately a rotten blow. He has been dealt a blow that indelibly seemed to unravel his life at the seams. Here's a spoiler alert. By the end of the season five, all sympathy for Walter is ultimately gone. Breaking Bad lives up to its name and we discover Walter's life is really quite a tragedy. Not because he's been dealt a bad hand, but because of all of the life decisions that he makes. All his decisions have consequences, and he finds he must ultimately live with every one of the consequences of his choice. Such as the life of Samson in the Old Testament, we encounter Samson at the end of his life. We read right before his death. In his story, we find these supernatural events that take place. We see intrigue. We see deception. We see humor. We see lust, sex, murder. And we even see revenge and obsession, which most of all we find in the person of Samson. 
We read in the end of his story that he's blind and in prison and he's made sport of or made fun of by his captors, the Philistines. In one last heroic act, the Bible says that Samson cries out to the Lord for strength one more time so that he can take revenge against the Philistines. And God hears his prayer and amazingly answers him and Samson literally takes these pillars and pushes them and brings the entire house down. But here's a question that I want to purport or suppose to each and every one of you, and that's simply this. How did mighty Samson get here? How did he get to this place in his life? How did he get to this road of destruction? How did he get to this position in his life? And I want to suggest that it was by all of the life choices that he made. And I want to suggest to those of you friends who are listening to me online, all of the choices that you make have a consequence. Every single decision, whether it be where you live, who you hang with, where you hang out at, what kind of car you drive, what person you marry, what person you date, what school you go to, what education you have, where you live, all of these things are choices that you and I are, are able to make, and God allows us to be free model agents to make any decision we want to make, but God holds exclusive rights to every consequence. And the truth of the matter is, many of us, friends, are living some of the consequences of our choices. We are living day by day some of the consequences of choices that we made. That person that you married, that your family told you that ain't the one. Everybody saw it but you, but you married them anyway. And your life has not been the way you intended it to be because of the choice that you made. That job that you're on because you got frustrated because they didn't give you a raise at the job that you were on and as a result, because you were hot-headed, you decided to leave early and take another job somewhere else and saw, said that you would move up in the ladder and you've been there 10 years and they still got you in the mail room. Choices that we make. Some young lady, some young man in a college campus somewhere and some kind of way you started dating him or dating her and the relationship was going great and your friends saw that there was something there and you refused to see it and as a result of that, the relationship is on the rocks and it's all because of life's choices. And I want to suggest to every friend, every person that's online today that every choice you make will not only have a consequence, but you have to reap and sow everything that you've done. And so as we look at the life of Samson, there are three things I believe that Samson shows us about the choices that he makes. And one of those things is simply this. Compromise can ruin your potential. Here it is. Compromise can ruin your potential. Samson's story begins in Judges 13 with his miraculous birth. The Bible says his nameless barren mother is visited by an angel of the Lord who ultimately announced that she would have a son and that they would dedicate him to the Lord under this Nazarite vow as a Nazarite birth and he would be a rescuer of Israel from their Philistine oppressor. The Bible teaches us that she named this child Samson and the Bible teaches us in the Hebrew this word Samson ultimately means sunshine. Here it is, if we follow the history of the nation of Israel, we come to understand that they were in a dark time in their lives. They were dealing with Philistine oppression. War was impending. They were challenged on every corner, every issue of their life. But ultimately, God sends sunshine to their darkest hour. And I want to suggest to some friend that's listening to me online that even in your darkest hour, God will send sunshine. Even in your darkest moment, God knows how to send the Samsons of our lives. Even in the darkest place that you are currently in, that God knows how to send us sunshine. And the truth of the matter is that whatever we're in, whatever we find ourselves in, God knows how to send us sunshine. And here it is, the Bible teaches us that as a Nazarite, Samson made a vow unto God. He makes three vows unto God as a Nazarite. Here's the first vow, and that is drink no wine, nor eat any fruit that grew on a vine. 
The second vow that he makes is refrain from touching anything dead. And then the third vow as a Nazarite that he makes is never cut your hair so as long as you shall live. Samson grows into a young man and the Bible says we are told that the Lord blesses him as he grows up. He's being blessed day by day. And so here's a guy whom the Lord blesses and who he is consecrated ultimately from birth to be a Nazarite. And from some reason, Samson did not quite embrace that he had been consecrated, ultimately set aside not to be like anybody else. Samson was not supposed to be like anyone else, and he does not embrace that he's not like those that he comes in contact with. And let me suggest, believers, that any time you don't embrace who you are, you'll be defined by someone else's opinion of who you are. There are some young person that is listening to me, and you just have the re reality or the lifestyle that you are not like anybody else. Your mama makes you go to church. Your family makes you pray before you eat. You don't, are not like anybody else. And every time you try to fit in, it just seems as though you can't fit in. And the truth of the matter is that God has consecrated you from the very beginning of your birth, which means that God has set Set you aside not to be like everybody else, not to act like everybody else, not to walk like everybody else. And the truth is that when you are a child of God, you're not supposed to be like everybody else. And let me say that one of the reasons why so many of our youth and our children are finding themselves in precarious situations because of the choices that they make is because they have parents that haven't realized that God has not only consecrated you, but he's also consecrated your child. And the real truth is that because God set you aside, he wants you to also teach your child that they must also be set aside. Here it is, right from the start, Samson had everything going for him. He had money, he had talent, people loved him, and the truth of the matter is that God loved Samson. He had godly parents who loved him and worshiped the Lord and who gave Samson good and godly wisdom. Samson was handpicked by God from Judges 13, and Samson was blessed with great physical strength and stamina. And the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. And don't you run over that, friends, because one of the great blessings that you and I have in our lives is knowing that the Spirit of the Lord is upon us. The Bible says that Samson now has the Spirit of the Lord upon him. What a tremendous foundation on which to build. What great potential on which to build. But here's the question of the day. What went wrong with Samson? God was with him. His family was godly. His family pushed him into godliness. He had known what it was to be a Nazarite, and yet still something went wrong. And let me say to some parent here today, don't you take for granted the fact that just because your child goes to church, just because they make good grades, just because they have not given you any trouble yet, you must stay on the battlefield for the Lord, watching over them, making sure you pray for them, because the enemy enemy, as according to 1 Peter 5, is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And the reason why so many of our young people are devoured is because we got parents who are not on the wall. We got parents who do not understand that it is your responsibility to watch them. It is your responsibility to conform them. It is your responsibility to separate them. It is your responsibility to give them what it is to have Christ in their lives. And the Bible says that Samson makes a tragic turn because of one choice that led him down the wrong path. And I want to suggest the reason why Samson is where he is is because he compromised. The church say compromise. Because he had no self-control, because he had no self-discipline, Samson compromises. Samson compromised by not keeping God's law. We hear about Samson's strength. We hear how he slew a lion with his bare hands. But what we don't hear about is that he later returned to the carcass where God told him don't touch any dead thing. And the Bible says that there was a honey 
inside where bees had laid honey and resided in, and thus breaking one of his Nazarite vows, he goes in and gorges himself on eating the honey out of the carcass. It's not that he could not have corrected what he did. He could have gone to the temple priest and been ceremonially cleansed, but when you begin compromising, you don't see the need to be right with God or see the need to be right with people. Samson, somewhere between being blessed and seeing the Spirit of the Lord upon him, started getting arrogant and where he was. Everything was going right. One, two, three, four, five, whatever he wanted, it was happening for him. And as a result of things happening for him, he started getting arrogant in his watch with God. And so Samson now makes a choice that starts him down the wrong path. The law, according to Scripture, said that Samson was not to break the Nazarite vow. But Samson operates in the principle, not thy will, Lord, but mine be done. And brothers and sisters, friends, whenever you start operating in my will versus God's will, when you start functioning in how I want things to be and not how God wants things to be, we start ignoring the counsel of his godly parents and start ignoring the counsel of those who God sends to be wise of foes in each and every one of our lives. Let me say to some young person, mark it down. Compromise is always manifested because of a lack of self-control. Anytime you compromise, it is because you have no self-control. What Samson wanted, he wanted now, even if it meant compromising the law of God. Samson felt that he needed to have what he wanted at this particular moment. It reminds me of a statement made by Bishop Glenn Pace, who said it best when he said, don't mistake the lack of self-control for freedom. His lack of control led Samson to believe he was free to do whatever he wanted to do, even if it meant breaking his Nazarite vow. Samson had potential, but he was allowing it to be ruined by compromise. How many of us can be honest online today and simply say that where I am in life, is because I compromised the principle that I knew I should not have compromised. How many of us are where we are in life because we compromise sleeping around? How many of us are where we are in life because we compromise picking up something we didn't pay for? How many of us compromise our principles and our morals so that we can get ahead? And that's what Samson did. So one of the main reasons that Samson is where he is is because he allowed compromise to ruin his potential. Here's a second thing, beloved, that I believe that Samson teaches us today about choice and consequence. And that is there comes a time when God leaves us to the consequences of our choices. Here it is. There comes a time when God leaves us to the consequences of our choices. Samson breaks the last vow with a woman named Delilah. Here it is. Samson breaks the vow with a woman, a chick, by the name of Delilah. She seduces him into telling her the secret of his strength. The Bible says we hear of him cutting his hair off, but we don't hear of his ongoing weakness for immoral women. Now see, he, we hear now of his brute strength. We hear of how he ripped the city gates at the Philistines at Gaza and carried all 700 pounds of it, nearly 40 miles to Hebron. But we don't hear that he was visiting a prostitute where he was. But Samson, according to Scripture, it starts out with prostitution. And then he finds himself with Delilah. And the Bible says he falls in love with Delilah. Can I give you the Greek word here or the Hebrew word here for Delilah? Carries the idea of temptress, which means that Samson not only fell in love with the woman, but he fell in love with temptation. And the truth of the matter is that so many of us have fallen in love with temptation that as long as I can just dabble around with it, as long as I can play close to it, as long as I can do some of it and not all of it, and the truth of the matter is, it starts off at just one puff. And then before you know it, you're taking two and three puffs. And before you know it, you're missing class because you had a puff. 
and before you know it, you're dropping out of school because you're puffing all day long. Because that's how sin works. Anytime you flirt with sin, you find yourself not only being tempted, but you find yourself living the lifestyle of sin. So the idea here is that Samson fell in love, not only with Delilah, but he fell in love with temptation. But can I give you another Hebrew derivative of this Delilah? Is that he not only fell in love with Delilah, he not only fell in love with temptation, but he fell in love with sin. And the truth of the matter is that so many of us have not only fallen in love with temptation, but we've fallen in love with sin. As long as I can do it and get away with it. As long as I can keep messing up and getting away with it. As long as don't nobody know my business, it's all right. But can I tell you about the God that is up high and looks low? Can I tell you that you may be able to fool me, you may be able to fool them, but you sure enough can't fool God. And so to some person here today, I am giving you a stern warning, and here's the warning today. And that warning is simply this, that one day God is going to leave you to the consequences of your choices. And there's somebody sitting in their living room right now. You can't say amen, but you at least ought to say ouch. Because the truth of the matter is that you're living the consequences of your choice. The Bible says that these leaders now, they cut a deal with the lovely Delilah. They said, find out the secret of his power, and we'll give you money that you won't even be able to have enough of. Mark it down, brothers and sisters, friends, young people. Money can overcome a lot of love if that is where your heart is. Yes, Say it one more time. Money can overcome love if that is where your heart is. Scripture says that she agrees. Delilah now takes the bid. And watch this. Three times she asks him. Three times she wants to know. And three times Scripture says that he keeps on lying to her. Three times they come to arrest him. Three times. He uses his strength to escape. But then the fourth time, because sin never really leaves you alone, the fourth time it shows up again. And let me tell someone today that when the Lord gives you a way of escape, you better learn how to take it. When God gives you an escape, three times he's sitting with this woman and three times she asks him about his strength and three times men come to take him, to kill him, and three times the Lord lets him escape. Let me say that one, one other way. Three times you didn't get caught over there. Three times you didn't caught driving up to there. Three times it didn't go the way they thought it was going to go. And you mean to tell me a fourth time you go back again? And so here it is, brothers and sisters, the Bible is telling to teach you and me that when God gives you a way of escape, you better learn how to take that escape. Tell your neighbor, take that escape. Because you ought to learn not to go back to him because God allows you to escape that fool the first time. He lets you escape a second time. He lets you escape a third time. And you went back a fourth time? And here it is, you ought not go back to that situation. God lets you get out of that mess and you want to go back a fourth time? God will allow you to suffer the consequences of your choice if you don't learn how to have the spirit, I ain't going back there no more. And I wonder today, is there anybody other than me that has the mentality that I'm not going back no more? You have the mentality that I'm not going back to that anymore. I have the mentality I'm not going to let the enemy tempt me to go back. The Bible says four times, Samson has not figured out Delilah is out to get him. Four times, and he has not figured out that Delilah is out to get him. Delilah says, watch this now, if you love me, here it is, you tell me. She gives him an ultimatum. It's interesting that sin always gives you an ultimatum. She gives him an ultimatum, watch this, if you have to choose between their love and God's love, you better choose God. Samson had a choice. Hear me. Samson had a choice. Choose God or choose Delilah. And listen to the choice that Samson makes. He succumbs to the nagging, and now he gives her the secret of his strength. And the Bible says, gets his hair cut off. Here it is. And thus he broke the final and third vow unto God. He breaks the third vow 
unto God. Samson went to sleep, and now she cuts his hair off. And the Bible says that they arrest him, and they gouge his eyes out, throw him in prison, and then make fun of him. Keep in mind that they put him in prison, which is slave's work. Here is a judge of Israel who was declared to be able to stand mighty for the people of God. He had the responsibility of overthrowing the Philistine government, and now he subject himself to so much sin that now he's in the prison of his enemies. Let me suggest to someone that sin's chief motive is to ultimately enslave you. Ch sin's chief motive is to ultimately put you and me in bondage. And because Samson had no regard for his vow unto God, watch this. We read the saddest testimony of Scripture. The Bible says that Samson knew not that the Lord had departed from him. Let me say that one more time. Samson knew not that the Lord had departed from him. He had so much sin in his life that he knew not that God was no longer with him. When we read about the life of Samson, in every chapter you read, and the Lord was with him, and the Lord was with him. And then when we get to this third vow that Samson breaks, the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord leads him, and Samson does know not. And I want to suggest to somebody here today, it's a terrible thing to don't know when God has fired you. Say that one more time. It's a terrible thing when God fires you and you don't know it. And one of the ways that we declare it is that when you start singing and you don't feel the same power, when you preach and the power ain't with you, when you teach and you still not feel nothing, and then you're trying to figure out, I'm in church and it just don't feel the same. Because anytime God fires you and his spirit leaves you, life will never be the same. And so here it is, brothers and sisters, when you look at the movement here, we were not only reminded of uh, Brother Samson, but we also recall Brother Saul, because the Bible says he was ordered by God to wipe out the Amalekites and all of their inhabitants. And the Bible says that he did not know that God's spirit had departed from him. And one of the ways that God's spirit departs from us is when we are disobedient to God's word. Samson was disobedient. And now here it is, Saul was disobedient. And the Bible says that neither of these great men in the Bible knew that the Spirit of God had departed from them. It caused me to ask a question to some friend online, is God still with you? It caused me to ask a question to some friend online, how do you know the Spirit is still with you? And friends, God's presence in life demands our obedience. Here it is. If you're going to have the presence of God, it demands that you and I become obedient to God. And here it is, and I'm in my seat when I tell you this, even in our failures, here's the last one, even in our failures, God does not abandon us. Even in our failures, God does not abandon us. In Judges 16, verse 23 to 31, Samson is beaten, Samson is made fun of, Samson is broke, his eyes have been gouged out, he had been hot-tempered. He had been rebellious in life. He had practiced what he wanted to practice, and he's a washed-up warrior. And here he is. Samson's plight is a reminder that without the presence of God, that you and I are nothing. Without the presence of God, I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how well you dress. I don't care how big your network is. Without the very presence of God, all of us are nothing. And here it is, brothers and sisters, friends. Samson stands before the people of a shell of a man that what he had been. Yet in his darkest hour, yet in his humiliation, yet in his imprisonment, Samson does something that you and I must learn how to do. And that is, no matter how wrong we are, no matter the consequences that we're facing, the Bible says that Samson, with a heartfelt cry, turns unto God. The Bible says that Samson prays for strength so that he may deal with his captors. Samson prays to the God of the heavens to know that God could give him the strength to be able to do what he couldn't do within himself. Samson understood that whatever he was dealing with, that he could always turn to God. 
And I'm suggesting to some young person that's listening to me online, you must know that no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, that you, like Samson, can turn unto God. You can be in the darkest hour. You can be in the darkest moment. You can be in the darkest situation. But no matter where you are, you got to get to the mindset that he's still my God. You got to get to the mindset that no matter what I'm going through, that I know how to turn unto God. And so, brothers and sisters, can you see Samson where he is? He does not have eyesight. He does not have strength in his body. His hair has already been cut off. He's in the imprisonment of where he is. But Samson had enough sense to say, devil, you took everything but my mouth. And Samson understood that with our mouth, we got to learn how to call on God. The Bible says that Samson had enough sense to call on the Lord. And the Bible says that where, where he was, then he called on God, that God strengthened him. And Scripture says he got a young lad to put him up against the leaning post. And Samson wraps his arms around one leaning post and wraps his arms around another leaning post. And some 3,000 Philistines now who had been laughing at Samson, who thought that Samson's life was now over. The Bible says that Samson mustered up enough strength. And Scripture doesn't say all of what Samson said. It just says, Lord, give me strength one more time. And I hear somebody saying, Lord, I'm in a bad situation, and I need you to give me strength one more time. And there ought to be somebody here today that don't mind testifying that you called on the name of the Lord, and he gave you strength one more time. And the truth is that when you call on God, and that when you call on God right, that God got a way of giving you strength and strength where you need it. And brothers and sisters, on the contrary of where Samson was, Samson had enough relationship with God to know that no matter how bad off he was, that he served the God that gave him presence and power. And Samson understood that as long as God gives me presence, that God can also give me power. And not only did God give him presence, but God give him provisions, which means that Samson had enough sense to know that if he calls on the name of the Lord, that God will give him everything that he needs. And so I'm talking to some young person today to understand that even in the midst of what you're dealing with, you need to know that you ought to have a Samson spirit. And here's a Samson spirit that no matter where I am in life, that God will never leave me by myself. No matter where I am in life, I can call on the name of the Lord. And I can hear some young person saying that I've been in a bad position and I want to break bad because of the choices and the consequences that I'm now living. And I want to suggest to some young person, it's not how you start, but it's ultimately how you finish. And the Bible says that Samson started off really good, but somewhere between his start and the middle of his life, Samson started making some unwise decisions. But Samson had enough sense to know that if you call on the name of the Lord, that God will give you the strength that you need. That if you call on the name of the Lord, that God can help you escape whatever you're in. That if you call on the name of the Lord, that God can bring you out of any dark corner that you're in. That if you call on the name of the Lord, that God could shine light bright in any situation that you're in. And there ought to be some friend of God that don't mind testifying that when you call on the name of the Lord, that he will help you come out of some situation, that he will bring you out of some circumstances. Is there anybody here that don't mind testifying? Well, if you don't mind testifying that God will bring you out of some circumstances, that God will bring you out of some situations, I dare you to put your left hand together and put your right hand together and begin to give the Lord some praise. Is there anybody here today that don't mind testifying that he walks with me and that he talks with me and that he tells me that I'm his own and even though I've had some compromise and even though I've made some bad decisions, I've learned that even in my consequences that I can call on the name of the Lord. Is there anybody here that 
that knows that if you call on God right, that God will turn your situation around. Come here, David. David will tell you that the Lord will blot out your transgression and that the Lord will create in you a clean heart and renew the right spirit within you. Is there anybody here today that don't mind testifying that the Lord will create in you a clean heart and renew the right spirit within you. And no matter what darkness that you're in, no matter what choice that you made, if the long as the Lord gives you life, as long as the Lord gives you strength, as long as the Lord gives you lips, you can call on the name of the Lord. And the Bible says in 1 John 1 and 9 that the Lord is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Is there anybody here today that knows that he will cleanse you? Is there anybody here today that knows that he will turn you around? Is there anybody here today that knows that God will bless you? Well, if you know that God can still bless you, even in spite of your choices, even in spite of your decisions, why don't you let some young person know that I made some mistakes, that I had a baby out of wedlock, that I lied before, that I stole before, but God knows how to turn that thing around. And I don't mind praising the Lord because he knows how to give you what you need when you don't deserve it. And so I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Is there anybody here that don't mind praising the Lord? Well, open up your mouth and give him the fruit of your lips because God is worthy. Shout, the Lord is worthy. Shout, the Lord is worthy. Somebody say, yes, he is. He's real worthy. The Lord is worthy. Breaking bad. Choices and consequences. Samson made some bad choices. Samson made some bad decisions. And he found himself in a precarious position. He was made the light of Israel, and yet he found himself in darkness. And the question today, this morning is, how do I get out of darkness? How do I change my circumstance? How do I change my situation? And Samson gives us what I'd like to call a theological turnaround. He simply says, Lord, because he cries out, if you just give me strength. And the truth is, God is just waiting for some young person, some young man, some young girl in the darkest hour of your life to muster up enough strength to just cry out to God. I know the enemy is making you think that because you've done it that uh, you can never turn around and because of what you've done that it can never work out for you because of where you've been that God is upset with you. But the truth is that God loves you so much that even in sin, you may have broken the fellowship, but you can never break the relationship with God. And so I want to challenge some young person, some child of God, some senior saints, whatever you've done during this pandemic, maybe you've gotten outside of God. Maybe you've done some things that you're not proud of. Maybe you've been compromising and it's been ruining your testimony. Maybe you slept around. Maybe you took some things that didn't belong to you. Maybe you started using some words, some verbs, some nouns that you shouldn't be using. Whatever it is, I need you to know that even in your darkest hour, if you just lift up your hands right where you are and just say, Lord, here am I, God can turn that thing around. So as they prepare to sing, you need to know that God is your strength. You need to know that God has given you the spirit of a sound mind. And don't let the enemy rob you of your blessing. Don't let the enemy make you compromise this opportunity to be in a relationship with God. So on our screen right now, by relationship or fellowship, accept the Lord Jesus Christ as they sing.
Friends, one time, why don't you say, pointing to yourself, God, you are my strength, like none other. Amen and amen again. We pray that this message has been a blessing to you, and we pray that you've taken an opportunity to reach out to God and to fix whatever those challenges are, whatever those issues may be. We trust that God would do what only God can do in the supernatural, and that is change our hearts. And so I pray that you come back into relationship, fellowship with the loving God, and that God will continue to do what only God can do by his power and ultimately by his might. Amen and amen again. Listen, it's time to worship God in our giving. It's this wonderful time where you and I can be a part of this service, not only by our praise, not only by our worship, but ultimately by being able to give back into the kingdom of God. This is a wonderful time as we serve God in giving. There are at least five ways that you can give here at New Faith Church. You can give in person, through text, online, cash app, and then ultimately you can mail in your tithes, your offering, and also your pastoral support. We believe that even in this pandemic, that God has shown himself to be a faithful God. There are some of you that hasn't missed a beat. Ultimately, God has shown himself to be favorable unto you. God has given you grace and mercy. You have not missed a beat, not with your bills, not in your finance. You haven't missed a meal. Everything has worked well for you even in this pandemic. And I've heard some testimonies that God has even been so good to some of you that God has given you increase. That's right. There are some of you that receive raises during a pandemic because that's the kind of God we serve. And then I want to challenge those of you, wherever you are, whatever you're struggling with, you might be struggling with this idea of compromising the biblical tithe. You already heard through the life of Samson that compromise can ruin the promises of God. And so I want to challenge you not to compromise the biblical tithe. I want to challenge you to prove God according to his word that he won't open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you don't have room enough to receive. And then I also want to challenge those individuals who have not yet given to biblical tithing. I want to challenge you to test God because God is not a man that he should lie, that whatever he said, he will bring it to pass. Let's pray that God will bless you and that God would give you increase. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you now. Uh, for what eyes have seen and ears have heard. Father, we thank you for those individuals now who are preparing their hearts to give unto you. We pray now in the name of Jesus, O oh God, that they won't compromise the biblical tithe. And then, Father, that they would stand on your word, that you would rebuke the devourer for their name's sake. And then, Father, we pray now in the name of Jesus, O oh God, that you would uh, multiply their giving, that you would multiply their earnings, O oh God, of some 100-fold. And then, Father, we pray for some man, some woman, some child, some young adult who may be struggling with giving today. We pray now, O oh God, that you would prick their hearts and show them that you are God. And then, God, we pray for some person who has lost their job in this season of pandemic. We pray now in the name of Jesus, O oh God, that you continue to cover them, continue to watch over them, continue to garrison their lives. Help them to appreciate that only what you do for Christ shall last. And then, Father, we pray now that you bless the tithe that come into this storehouse so that we might be able to do more things in the District K community so that people might know that Christ in the life really does make a difference. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, we want to pause just for a moment to thank all of you who are streaming with us this morning, we don't take it for granted that you tuned into New Faith Church, whether it be through our Facebook, Instagram, or whether it be through our streaming faith service, or even our website or YouTube. We pray that this message, this service, this worship experience, the singing, the praising, the worship, and the witness to the word has been a tremendous time in your life on this Sunday morning. We also pray that you take this message to other individuals, that you pause and even share it with family and friends. 
That's right, share it with family and friends. There's somebody in your network that needs to hear this word, and we believe that God has put you in a position now where not only to be a disciple, but also to evangelize, and you can evangelize quickly by simply pressing a button. And then certainly we thank God for all of you who attended an historical black college or university. I'm not going to get into which one is the best. I've heard some say Grambling. I've heard some say Southern. I've heard some say Prayer View. I've heard some say Texas Southern and so on. All I'm going to say is that I thank God for those of you who took the time to send your money and earn your education in a historic black university. We pray that because you've been through those kinds of universities that you help people to appreciate that Christ in a life really does make a difference. Listen, I look forward to seeing each and every one of you in our Wednesday night Bible study, and I pray that God continues to bless you and that you remember the importance of conveying the light. Have a blessed week, New Faith. We love you and we thank you. Well, hey, family. We hope you all enjoyed our service today. Did y'all enjoy service? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Good yeah. deal. Yeah. Please remember to like us on all of our social media outlets. And if you don't have a church home, please think about New Faith. We love our church.